Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz, and I am a PT assistant. Today, I will be interviewing Jordan on the effects food has on your blood sugar. Jordan has a bachelor's in exercise science, a master's in nutrition, and she is also a certified personal trainer. You may recognize her from doing the follow along exercise videos on our channel as well. So without further ado, here is Jordan. All right. Welcome back to the podcast, Jordan. Hey, thanks, Mike. Today, we are going to talk about the effects food has on your blood sugar. So the first question I have is we're going to start with the simple question. What exactly is blood sugar and how does it work in your body? All right. That's probably a good place to start. Um, so we shouldn't go ahead assuming people even know what blood sugar means. Um, so I don't I'm not into talking super sciencey. Like when we have the conversation of blood sugar, sometimes it can get a little bit. So I want to try to keep this on the lighter side um, so that I don't bore everybody like we're in a college lecture room. So that's my goal anyways. So stop me if I'm getting What too, if I like college lectures? Too deep. Well, I mean. I'm just kidding. Then, Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm going to try. I'm going to try to kind of, for lack of a better word, dumb it down a little bit and keep it a little bit more exciting. Um, but anyway, so blood sugar. Let's just start um, kind of simple and break it down a little bit. So basically when we eat carbohydrates coming from our diet, um, they become sugar in the blood. Okay. Specifically, they turn into glucose. Um, glucose then kind of travels through our bloodstream and that's refer referred to as our blood sugar, right? So here's the thing though. Um, our body can't handle a ton of sugar in the blood at a time. We can't just eat as many carbs as we want, and then it can just hang out there as sugar in the blood. So we have mechanisms in our body to kind of get rid of excess. So um, kind of a fun fact, your body can only handle about a teaspoon of sugar in the bloodstream at any given time. Um, so we have to control this. Um, so what happens is our blood sugar is kind of regulated by different hormones. So if we have too much um, insulin comes in, I'm sure everybody's heard of insulin at least, but that's what its role is. It's basically we have too much sugar in the blood. So insulin comes in to try to get it out of the bloodstream. Um, and then we have other hormones that if our blood sugar dips too low, um, cortisol and glucagon are actually other hormones that help to raise it. So we have these mechanisms that kind of keep blood sugar at bay or at normal levels, if you will. Um, so, but, you know, the thing is we need sugar in our blood. It's not like we can't have, we can't have any. So our body can handle, can handle some. Um, the problem is, um, which... I feel like this same conversation comes up in anything we talk about food, but we're getting too much, right? It's right. no mystery. Like we are a nation of very unhealthy individuals eating way too much sugar. So um, it's kind of a side tangent, but I just, when I was kind of doing some research for the podcast um, to create some content for this, I came across a couple stats on um, how much sugar we're actually eating. Cause I do think it relates to this. Um, but we are eating like 100 times more sugar per year per person than we were like 150 years ago. Um, this is even more powerful. The average American 150 years ago was having about two pounds of sugar per year. Now it's like over 200 pounds. <laughs> Isn't that disgusting? <laughs> I, yeah, I know it's a lot. I mean, a lot of it's yeah. processed food and just availability of it. But yeah compared yeah. to back then. And we'll, we'll probably touch on that later with some other questions, but basically kind of to sum up that question, blood sugar is simply like you eat carbohydrates or sugar, whatever, either, or it, and that's what your blood sugar is then. Right. And, and there, I, there is an interesting statistic out there that one third of the U S is diabetic or pre-diabetic now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and that's why, I mean, we're consuming way more sugar. Right. So let's talk about what foods have the biggest impact on blood sugar. I know you said carbohydrates, but you want to get more in depth on it? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the, what I would feel more obvious ones. Um, I want to touch on them because I think it's important people are aware of this. Um, but then I'm going to go into some not so obvious ones. that will probably shock people a little bit, but um, so foods that have the biggest impact on blood sugar, obvious ones, um, soda, stop drinking it. <laughs> it's yeah. just basically, I would say that's one of the gosh, one of the worst things. Um, actually juice too. Um, that actually might shock people. So maybe I'll save that one. Um, let's save the, the 
uh, juice conversation, sports drinks, um, candy, um, pure sugar. Uh, so the not so obvious ones are going to be um, so juice. Let me talk about that. I'll circle back to that right away. So a lot of times people think, well, if it's 100% juice, right, that's fine. Um, the problem is juice, we're stripping out all of the fiber from it. So what happens, and we're going to talk about this again in a later question, but it's just causing this big blood sugar rust. There's no fiber or anything to slow down the digestion. So it just spikes the blood sugar up much like, you know, a Mountain Dew does. Right. Um, arguably hardly better, maybe slightly because it doesn't have all the toxic dyes and things like that. But as far as um, the impact it has on your blood sugar, it's huge. Um, other things that have a um, pretty large impact are going to be um, any kind of bread, um, pasta, rice, um, especially when you eat those things alone. Um, energy bars actually are like uh, a top one, we think healthy, grab a cliff bar, mm -hmm. huge blood sugar spike because they're um, void of a lot of protein or healthy fats. They're just chocked full of sugar and carbohydrates. Um, and actually I can't have this conversation without touching on, I don't want to demonize fruits and vegetables. That's not my point. Cause we're going to get into how you eat fruits and vegetables, but how you can do it in a better way. Mm -hmm. Um, but things like starchy vegetables, potatoes, even sweet potatoes, squash. Well, yes, they have a place in the diet. If you just eat them by themselves, they're going to spike your blood sugar. Um, right. Carbohydrates without fats and proteins is going to yes. spike your blood sugar way more than if you're eating all together. 100%. Yeah, that's, that, and that's going to be kind of key with a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how we can, you know, pair things together. It's not that those foods are inherently bad. It's when we are consuming them all by themselves. Um, even things, you know, fruit too. Um, bananas are a really high one. Grapes, huge impact on blood sugar, blood glucose levels. Um, uh, what did I miss? Apples, um, somewhat not as much as like banana or grapes, um, corn. It's a big one too. So yeah. I'm not hitting all of it, but those are some of the main contenders and your obvious processed sugary foods. I feel like it can go without saying on that one. We all know if we eat a bowl of ice cream, it's probably <laughs> Sure. No, probably not. Most ice creams high fructose corn syrup now anyway. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's void of fats if it's low fat. So it technically spikes your insulin even more. But yeah. Yeah. So how would someone balance their blood sugars with food? Um, well, we kind of spoiler alert started touching on this for a second, but um, it's honestly, it's going to be more of a simple answer than sometimes people want a complex answer, but the answer is really simple. So the way we do this um, or balance your blood sugar with your food is whenever you eat, you balance your meals. So you don't just eat a banana. You would, for example, eat a banana with a handful of almonds. So the point here is um, balance your meals whenever you're eating carbohydrates. Make, sorry, there's a fly in here. <laughs> That's why I keep doing that. Um, you balance your um, carbohydrate intake with healthy um, fats and protein. Um, and what that does um, is helps to make sure that that insulin spike or your blood sugar spike is not as high when you're eating your, um, your carbohydrates. So right. um, I always like to, when I'm explaining this to people, because I've done a lot of work in the past with um, um, helping people with balancing blood sugar, not specifically working with diabetics, but just the normal healthy population and the importance. And we'll get into that and the health impacts it has, but, um, done a lot of coaching in the past with individuals on this topic. So I've always given kind of the same example. Um, so most Americans, um, you're probably not most Americans, Mike, but most <laughs> Americans, they wake up and they're going to pour themselves a bowl of cereal. Right. I mean, that's that was me when I was younger. I mean, that was the normal yeah. thing in the nineties. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. Oh, I did that too. Um, and then a lot of times, uh, we're putting like skim milk on it. Right. Yeah. And then you're, you're going to maybe have a glass of like orange juice or something on the side. Yeah. And um, you're going to be hungry two hours later. Correct. Yes. Yes. So that all that is doing, um, that typical American breakfast, I like to call it. It's, um, it's spiking our blood sugar at a normal range and it's causing all sorts of issues. But on a, 
on a um, simple standpoint, what happens is our blood sugar spikes. Insulin has to come in to get the blood sugar back down, like I already talked about in the beginning. And then what's going to happen soon after that, for some people, it can be a half hour. Others, two hours later, you have a big crash. You have an energy dip. Your body's going to tell you it's time to eat more carbs. So then you're going to go to the work break room, grab a donut, or you're going to go reach for some candy, or you're going to go reach for something sugary because your body is, your blood sugar is low then. So, right. um, I mean, that's so, why yeah. you okay. can, like when I was younger, before I realized all this, you realize like, how come I can eat like a whole bag of pretzels? <laughs> but yeah. like, if I were like, if I'm going to eat a whole bunch of chicken breasts, like I get very sick of it after a while. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, I mean, carbohydrates aren't super satiating. They taste good, but. Right. And if you don't but, have it with something fat and protein, it's going to have a bigger spike. Right. Right. Yeah. So the, the key with this whole question is just, it's not to say don't eat carbohydrates. That's not the point of, of any of this topic. It's not to say that carbohydrates are bad, that fruit fruit and starchy vegetables are bad. Um, it's just to educate you on the importance of what we can pair with our food to um, mitigate the impact it has on your blood sugar levels. So always right. balancing your meals out is super important. So do you want to give some examples of specific snacks or meals someone could eat if they want to stabilize their blood sugar? I know you mentioned banana and almonds, but yeah, a few more examples for sure. Um, I'll kind of list some of my my go tos and then just know you could swap out, you know, fruit for fruit, different kind of nuts for different kind of nuts. But um, one of my I probably eat this, if not every day, every other day, an apple with almond butter. Um, I wouldn't eat an apple by itself. I mean, I'd say I wouldn't if I were in a pinch and I had to stop at a gas station. And it was my only choice. And it's not like I've never eaten an apple by itself. I try to avoid it though, because I know that if I do, I'm hungry in 30 minutes, it doesn't hold me over. Um, so an apple with almond butter is one of my go-tos. Um, uh, so like veggies with guacamole would be another good example. Um, if you do eat dairy, um, making sure you, you reach for like full fat. So full fat yogurt with berries would be another way you could balance out that snack. Um, banana with, I already mentioned that almonds or any other kind of nuts, pecans, um, walnuts. Um, so if you're going to have something like popcorn, um, you can actually make popcorn better. Um, I, I remember back in college, I had a, a stupid air popper that I would eat like nothing on it just a massive blood sugar spike now that I know better. Um, so if you're going to eat something like that for a, uh, you know, a snack, popping it in some coconut oil or avocado oil, and even topping it with some good quality grass fed butter, that is going to actually um, lessen the impact that high carbohydrate snack has on your blood sugar. If that makes sense. Yeah. And it's usually more palatable too. Well, yeah. <laughs> They're like, what, this nutritionist is coming on here and telling us to put butter on our popcorn? What? Yeah, I am. Um, take it or leave it. But I'm going to take it because uh, it tastes better. So I did um, actually see a microwave bag popcorn that was just avocado oil and salt. That exists? Yeah, I just saw it. The, I, I was like curious. I saw it. I didn't get it, but I was just like, huh. Well, like, that's interesting. Improvements. Yeah. We'll take that. Yeah. Um, other examples. Oh, um, if you have fruit on hand, that's usually just an easy snack for people, especially like on the go, grabbing an apple or banana, hard boiling eggs. Those have protein and healthy fats from the yolk. So that's a good thing that you can pair along with, um, when you're snacking, when you're building meals, it's, it's super simple, at least in my head, simple. Um, I mean, all of my meals, like dinner meals, unless I get fancy, they consist of some kind of meat or seafood. Um, and then I usually have like a starchy veggie and a non-starchy. So like if I'm going to have sweet potatoes, I'll also have like broccoli with it too. Um, and then I usually put butter on my sweet potato, for example, to lessen again, the impact of not having this big blood sugar spike, just to keep things more even keel. Um, so just when you're looking at your plate for dinner or lunch or breakfast, do I have a protein? Do I have a fat? And then your uh, carbs come from your starchy vegetables or fruit. Do you eat other carbohydrate sources? Like, do you eat grains at all? 
I don't. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, no. I the only thing that I might get away with once in a while is I'll eat um, eat a little bit of rice, but that's not not too often. Um, quinoa, which is right. technically technically a green. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I don't. I don't really do bread. Maybe a good piece of sourdough bread once in a while. All right. So, how does someone become insulin resistant? Um, okay. So this is another area I don't want to get too sciencey, but, um, so the way this kind of works is, you know, when we are constantly spiking our blood sugar, we have to call in insulin, right? I already talked about in the beginning that, um, we can only handle so much in our bloodstream at one time. So insulin has to come in, um, get it out of there. Um, and we're basically just overusing insulin is how this happens. So, you know, like I said, go back to that standard American breakfast. Somebody wakes up, they grab their bowl of cereal, pour their glass of orange juice, and then insulin has to come in because trust me, that's going to cause a massive blood sugar spike. So we've recruited insulin. Then we walk to the break room at work and we grab our donut. Again, our body recruits insulin. Then an hour later, it's already time for lunch. We eat our sandwich that we brought from home um, with two pieces of bread and a side of chips um, and a banana because we think we're being healthy. And once again, insulin's recruited. Then we're really tired like an hour or two later because our blood sugar was spiked and we're like, now we're hungry again or we need something, afternoon pick me up. So then we go to Starbucks and we grab our grande vanilla latte Again, blood sugar spikes. Was that your go-to drink or? No. no oh, okay. No. Um, I'm just, I'm speaking. I, I just observe. Um, and then we get home and we're just ravenously hungry. Um, so we, you know, have a snack while we're thinking about what we're going to have for dinner. So anyways, my point is some, like the average person might have six, seven, eight massive blood sugar spikes throughout the day. Well, every time that happens, insulin's recruited. So think of it this way. Insulin is just, it gets tired. <laughs> it just gets worn out for lack of a better word. Over time, our cells actually just become numb to insulin um, as a way to put it. And they just don't react to it anymore. So therefore the term insulin resistant. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. I mean, basically we have trouble getting the sugar out of our blood like you talked about earlier. And that's why people's you measure people's blood sugar to see if their insulin's working properly or not. Correct. Yeah. So if people want to get nerdy with it, that's kind of how it goes. Which is why, you know, like when we talk about type two diabetics, that's why they need insulin because their body's simply just, it's not producing it. So. Right. Yeah. So why is high blood sugar so bad? Uh, loaded question. There's a lot, a lot of reasons. Um, I would argue it, uh, most of our metabolic disorders or diseases um, that we're plagued with in the United States are worsened. I'm not saying this is the sole cause, but definitely worsened by irregular blood sugar levels. So when I say metabolic diseases, think, um, well, obesity is technically um, a metabolic disease, um, diabetes, um, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, a lot of a lot of those are linked and related to dysregulated blood sugar levels. So that's that's number one why why it's so harmful because it can lead to um, a lot of those issues. Um, we talked about energy levels a little bit. So although not as serious as a metabolic disease, it's pretty serious. If every day at two in the afternoon you want to fall asleep at your desk or you have to take a nap, um, a two hour nap just to get through your day. So those massive up and down swings of energy, people think that's normal, a mid afternoon slump, right? It's not, that's not normal. That's a sign of dysregulated um, blood sugar levels or you didn't sleep, but right. You know, if, if you're normally sleeping and you get that, that's not a good sign. And who wants to walk around with low energy all the time? Doesn't feel good. Also mood, a lot of mood disorders are, linked to this too, depression, anxiety, people don't always recognize that, or just a really poor mood. I mean, if you're not diagnosed with depression or anxiety, but um, you're just quote unquote moody. Um, maybe if your spouse tells you that or your significant other, you should check what you're eating. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, uh, I've, I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or getting hangry that, that term. Um, 
you know, that that's totally also just re, uh, related to your food choices and your blood sugar levels. Yeah. Like you shouldn't get hangry. You should be controlled. I mean, you're going to get hungry during the day, right? Uh, it's normal. But to get to the point where you, you need food right this second, actually, too, like when we're talking about women's health, um, if our viewers have heard of PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, that's greatly linked to dysregulated blood sugar levels as well. That could be, that's a whole other topic, you know, hormone health and all of that. But um, dysregulated blood sugar, high blood sugar definitely impacts hormonal levels, um, male and female. And then the other thing too, why, why is high blood sugar so bad? Well, this extra sugar that is in our bloodstream um, that we have to get out, right? It has to go somewhere. I didn't talk about that at the beginning, but excess is stored as fat. So I, and I know a lot of people don't uh, care to walk around with extra fat on their body. So that's even more motivation to um, control those blood sugar levels. Right. Yeah. Once your muscle glycogen and liver stores are filled, it goes into fat, which mm -hmm. if you're not working out all the time, like you're probably storing some as fat. For sure. Yeah. And like, like you said, um, there's certain individuals that can just handle more than others. Um, somebody who works an eight to five job sitting at a desk and then they come home and they watch Netflix for three hours. You don't need very many carbohydrates to sustain that lifestyle at all. No. Um, somebody who's getting up at five in the morning, going to the gym before work, they work an active job. Um, they go for a walk on their lunch break. They go for a bike ride after dinner, whatever. I'm just giving examples or the ultra marathoner or, um, Ironman triathlete, like those people are going to need carbohydrates. Well, I mean, need, no, because <laughs> <laughs> they can tolerate more typically tolerate. That's a great way to put it. Cause no, our body doesn't need carbohydrates, but they can, they can handle more and utilize those. Um, and so they're not going to have the massive like up and down swings because they're utilizing it. It's going to energy, but all right. Are there any other tips or tricks or specific foods that can help to naturally balance blood sugars? So, yeah, there's a couple other little hacks I can give you um, beyond the, the most important thing is going back to balancing your meals. Right. Um, but um, beyond that, to kind of really optimize a couple other like little tips and tricks I can give you. Um, have you heard of apple cider vinegar for this? Yeah, you know I've, that? Okay. I've had it before. Yeah. So apple cider vinegar, um, it actually slows down, um, the breakdown and absorption of carbohydrates. Um, so, and that's going to just basically slow the rise in your blood sugar, much like healthy fats and fiber, slow it down. Um, apple cider vinegar can also slow this down a little bit too. So a easy little practice is before you eat a meal, um, take like a tablespoon Mix it, dilute it with water because it'll eat yeah, away very, your teeth enamel. It's very, it's, it's very yeah. vinegary. It's not palatable. I, I don't find it overly palatable even diluted with water. I drink it sometimes. Um, um, but. If you put lemon in it too, and then sometimes like if you could put stevia or something in it, it's, yeah. it's like a weird lemonade then. Yeah, maybe. I'll try <laughs> that. I'll try that. Um, but yeah, that, that can be super helpful before your meals. Um, when I'm in, you know, I go through ebbs and flows of things I do for, for health, but um, I haven't done that for a while, but I used to, like when I was making dinner at night, I would pour myself like a little concoction of that, um, make myself a little healthy mocktail when I was making dinner. I haven't done that for a while. Maybe I will now, but um, that can be super beneficial. Um, the other thing I think it's just, it's kind of cool. Um, resistant starch. I hear that. Yeah, um, I actually have some carbohydrate, like it's called you can. Uh, it's more when I was doing marathons. Okay, uh, it, it's a it's a corn starch, but it doesn't affect blood sugar. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the in interesting thing with resistant starch is actually food produces it naturally too. So, like, um, to take for example, like potatoes. So, say you like bake potato to eat for dinner. It's going to massively spike your blood sugar. But if you bake it or cook it or whatever, roast it, um, and then you put it in the refrigerator for a day, and then you go eat it as leftovers, that process, it actually 
like forms resistant starch. Yeah. And that. therefore it has less of an impact on your blood sugar. Does rice do that too? Rice does too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have heard of that. I was thinking of the <laughs> the gels I had, but I don't know if like pasta I because I don't eat uh, yeah. gluten. Um, but probably like your, you know, your gluten free like brown rice pasta is gonna be the same thing as rice. But I, I can't say if like wheat does that or not. I'm not sure, but right. I don't tend to promote that anyways. So um, so resistant starch, that's another little hack. Um, also, I can't talk about this topic without talking about at least touching on sleep. I um, mean, the importance of getting adequate rest because um, lack of sleep can also lead to insulin resistance. So you can be doing all the right things in your life and eating perfectly. But if you're trying to walk around on four hours of sleep, like that's not good either. So yeah. um, making sure you're getting um, adequate sleep. Um, exercise too. Um, I'm a big fitness guru, so I can't have this topic too without talking about the importance exercise has on, um, stabilizing blood sugar and helping to just balance it naturally. Um, something, and it doesn't even have to be like, you got to go to a gym, you have to start some crazy routine. Um, something as simple as going for an after dinner walk is incredibly powerful or getting in the habit of, when you eat, like, even if you can go out for five minutes, like go out, get a little fresh air, move your body a little bit, that has a significant impact on the impact your food choices have on your blood sugar too. It also usually helps you digest your food a little quicker. Yes. They call them um, 10 minute walks after meals. I've heard about it. Yeah. A lot of people well, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. I am. Um, that's another thing when I'm trying to be more mindful with, I, I do try to move after it doesn't have to be long. You don't have to go for a. It's easier a this time of year versus winter coming soon. I will admit. Right. <laughs> yes. Even my dog doesn't like the winter. No, no. Do we have any other hacks, tips? Hacks or tips? Um, I mean, the basic supplement protocol that I have I've talked about before when I've been on this channel, but um, this, I'm not gonna like call out any like specific supplements, um, but you know, your general like fish oil and making sure you have adequate vitamin D levels. Um, I did a podcast on vitamin D, but vitamin D literally impacts everything. And if your levels are too low, that can also have an impact on your um, blood sugar. So vitamin D actually helps muscle cells respond to insulin too. So making sure that you're um, adequately supplemented with things you're not getting through your diet. Right. So what would be your top tip or was that your top tip? Mm, my top tip, um, you know, so I like to do this because not, you, know, you can't do everything. Not everybody can take all of this information and just do it overnight. Yeah, so people are slow, start slow and build slow up. to start. You've got to get rid of just the pure sugar drinks. I think right. yeah, like the soda, the juice, the Gatorade, the um, Starbucks latte with 70 grams of sugar in a uh, large, I don't even know how much it has. Sugary alcohol. I mean, alcohol spikes blood sugar in general, but. Right. But yeah, sugary alcohol, um, like your I don't or know. high carb beers, I guess as well. Right. Um, yeah. Just because like it, Sugar in the form of drinks, it has absolutely nothing to slow down the digestion process. It goes straight through. Um, so that would be honestly probably my top tip. I mean, there's going to be a lot of like food things that you you could do, but that alone right there is going to be insanely helpful. Um, I feel like that's kind of the obvious one. And the other big takeaway I want people to get from this too is um, balancing your meals out. So I, I spent um, in my last, my, my previous job when I was um, a nutritional health coach full time um, for a couple of years, I, people would come to me for a host of different reasons, right? Um, but I feel like I was like a broken record. I used the same conversation to help people fix a lot of issues. And it came down to how can we balance your blood sugar? Because it's related to so much. And so I spent most of my time coaching people on building a balanced plate, like protein, healthy carbs from fruits or vegetables, and um, healthy fat. Balance your meals, 
balance your snacks um, and avoid eating those carbs on their own, that's going to reduce your cravings also. And it's, it's going to keep your um, like sugary cravings at bay. So um, I know that's two things, but I feel <laughs> like okay. those are the I biggest just really like hone in on um, like that concept of balancing meals out um, breakfast. Like if you have to start somewhere after you, after you ditch your soda and your juice and your Gatorade and your sugary alcoholic drinks, all that. Um, you're like, okay, I'm ready for step two. Make your breakfast better. Like ditch the sugary breakfast. Um, have a savory breakfast, eggs and bacon. I'd rather see that on somebody's plate by far than um, the bowl of cereal or the bagel or the pancakes or the waffles or the muffin or the whatever people are eating. Change it to a savory breakfast, um, omelet, um, yeah, eggs and bacon, eggs and avocado. Um because when you start your day like that, then we're not going to get these, you know, cravings that come around at 10, 11 o'clock. You can just, you can better control it than I think when you start your day out, right? Is there like a optimal amount of eating frequency to control blood sugar more or no? Ooh, that's a great question. I've heard, I've tried six meals a day when I was younger and I've literally eaten like two or three and... I could say, honestly, like between three and four are better for me than six. I am going to, I'm going to second that with based upon um, personal observation amongst myself and working with other clientele, um, as well as just, you know, research on the topic too. Um, I think the whole six meals a day concept that we've been taught is, is honestly not optimal. Um, no, you're and, eating all day long. Correct. And then you're, you're constantly recruiting, um, like you never give your body a break from digestion too. If you're constantly in a fed state, your body never gets a break. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think more of that three to four meal is, is better than six for balancing blood sugar levels. Yeah, that's what I felt was way easier. It's just, I don't know. I don't like cooking that much either. No, it's, and you can <laughs> get away with too. I mean, we could do a podcast on intermittent fasting sometime because that's um that's another um topic. But you know, look, a lot of people find great success in that and not eating their first meal until, you know, noon for the day. Well, you're not gonna eat six times then. No, you gotta eat yeah, you gotta get used to bigger meals. I've I've done both, but yeah. All right. Any last remarks for controlling blood sugars? You know, I think we kind of covered everything. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us again. Hey, thanks. No problem.